There are two things that every mortal human being must know in the eternal scheme of things, and they work in a loop. They need one another. We need to know who is our God, and we need to know who we are. If we have the wrong understanding of God, we have the wrong understanding of self. If we have the really wrong understanding of self, we can develop a wrong understanding of God. It's a lot like that good wheel of salvation and good works. You've got to you're already saved in order to do good works, but if you're not doing good works, you probably aren't saved. It's this nice justification by faith alone, but the works that are prepared in advance for us to do. If you don't know exactly who you are, you're not going to see God clearly. And if you really have the wrong God, you're not capable of seeing yourself clearly. How this works in theological terms is this thing in Latin called coram Deo. What are those great nerdy phrases? Coram Deo. The existence of humanity in the view of God, in the sight of God, in the eyes of God, before God's presence. What are we and what is God? What are we, Coram Deo, and who is our God? All of our texts work for this today. Of course, the Israelites have a good, good idea who they are. Don't let us see the fire again. Someone must stand as a mediator between us and the Lord. The Lord God brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. He has delivered his law, for we are sinners. We are wretched, miserable sinners, and we are terrified of God. Because we know that we are miserable, wretched sinners, we know that we cannot stand before the fire. We cannot stand before the earthquake that shook the mountain. Moses coming down, glaring with the light of God's light. Hide us. Let us run and duck for cover. We are sinful people in the presence of God. They understand the righteousness of God and they understand their own sinfulness in view of that righteousness. And they're actually asking for a deliverer. They're asking for a mediator. They're knowing that someone must stand between us and naked godhood or otherwise completely revealed godhood has no choice but to destroy us. Standing before the perfection of Almighty God as we are means that he would immediately eliminate us. He must. We must perish because we are sinful. The mediation of Jesus Christ and the way that God and man work together in this trinity that we are covered by the blood of Jesus and therefore we can stand coram Deo in the place of Jesus. One who has been obedient, one who has one, we as one who have been washed by the one that is and has been obedient. Something must stand between us and God. If we are honest with ourselves, we know that we are wretched, and then we have a shot at having the correct God. If we have a false God, we get everything wrong. We don't even understand ourselves. Human beings were made in the image of God, but by the fall into sin, we certainly are not like him anymore, as it says his image and likeness in Genesis. We don't behave like God. We don't do godly things. We have given up on righteousness to become sinners from birth by the curse of sin. But we are still in God's image. We still have that on us. Jesus Christ who comes into the flesh, risen, glorified, eternal, he made us to look like him. There's a strange mind-numbing paradox. And yet this is our origin. Human beings, because of the fall into sin, are desperate to not be like God. We're desperate to do the things that change who we are. We change our sexual morals. We love wealth. We love gluttony. We love all the fleshly desires of the world. We love the things that feed our gratification, whether that be emotional, psychological, physiological. We crave after things that corrupt and pervert us to an extent that it twists the image of God. It becomes easier to forget who God is and to get God wrong. See, the universe is filled with the reminders of God who created all things. Humanity is filled with reminders of the God who created all things. His fingerprints are everywhere and his evidence inescapable. What we have learned in our sin is how to shut him out and pretend that he's not there. To be able to look at the overwhelming evidence of, of everything and pretend that it is accidental. But we have gone so much further than that. With our technology, we have learned to change ourselves. 
We have changed how we look at the universe. Thanks to virtual reality, we can make our own fake reality as real as the real thing, at least to our weak and sinful perceptions. We can change ourselves with enough alcohol and enough drugs, with enough hormones and enough scalpels. We can invent whole new sexualities and gender identities. We can brutalize the physiological form we were given to such an extent that it is unrecognizable as anything human because it is meant by Satan to make sure that it is unrecognizable in any fashion a reflection of God. When you and your gratification are God, you will find a way to fulfill it, brutalizing and mutilating and mutating God's own creation to serve you. This is so far beyond what we began at Babel, building a tower on our own, so we thought, of materials made by God, nevertheless building a tower to change our destiny and put ourselves in the place of God. We do it with outward technology. We do it with inward technology. We do it because of the spiritual sickness that is in our soul that is sin. It is so easy to lose sight of whose, cre whose image we were created in and who our creator then is. Having a wrong understanding of self, that those desires, those lusts, those perversions, those gluttonies, those things we covet and desire should be part of who we are to the extent that we will attach them to ourselves, inject them into ourselves, we will mutilate ourselves to fit them, changing ourselves to suit our lusts and desires rather than acknowledging God who has made us in his image and the need to be in that image. Now the Israelites knew exactly who they were at that moment despite all of their other failures. It's like when Peter realized who Jesus was and said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Not understanding redemption, but being taught the Pharisaic view, he at least understood enough to know that he was a miserable sinner and in the presence of God, he could not stand. But Christ, the mediator, had come. The Israelites now receiving the law at the mountain, receiving the law given as by angels to Moses, receiving the law say, don't make us see the Lord again. He will surely destroy us. And this is most certainly true. They understood then at that moment, in that situation, in this calling to faith, that they needed a mediator. And God had assured them that someday one even greater would come. One like Moses, but greater from among their brothers, who would be the permanent mediator standing between man and God stand in between our sinfulness and God's righteousness, making good again the things that we have fouled. John also, in our gospel reading, has a perfect idea of who he is and who God is. The Pharisees are not that sure. They send out Levites from the temple. It's really sort of fascinating when you analyze the text bit by bit. Levites from the temple and some of them priests, but later it tells us they were sent by the Pharisees. They dispatched someone that looked like they had more authority than them to ask the question because they didn't want to go out. It's a really interesting dynamic that will play out all the way to the passion when finally they even conspire with the Herodians, people that loved King Herod, all seven or eight of them in the entire kingdom. But politics makes strange bedfellows. Here they send out the Levite priests in their place to ask the question, who are you? Because they don't have the guts to ask John themselves, trying to put John on the spot the way they will Jesus so many times during his earthly ministry. But John openly says, now to be clear, he denies being Elijah. Jesus later will tell us that John came in the spirit of Elijah. It's not clear what they mean by the prophet, if they mean the Messiah, but he clearly says he is not. John denies, 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 not because necessarily John isn't a prophet. Of course, he is. He's denying whatever their misconception and preconception is. When someone asks you a loaded question like that, as a Levite sent at the behest of the Pharisees, are you a prophet? Well, what does that mean to you? What does that mean in your false religion? And what are all the false expectations connected with that John says over and over again, clearly, I am not Christ. I'm not him. I'm not him. I'm not him. I'm not any of the things you're thinking that I am because you've got it all wrong. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness as prophesied. The Christ is coming. In fact, he is here among you and you do not know him yet. 
somewhere in the crowd, Jesus of Nazareth. Because John knows who he is, a sinful man, a human, a mortal. He knows he is not the Christ, and he knows that he is not God. He will do what God has commanded, eat locusts and honey, not shave, not cut his hair, wear that camel's hair and that leather belt, and live out in the woods because God said so. Not that he was ever sinless. No one is but God and Christ, God in Christ. But nevertheless, as a man of faith, he knew what he was and what his place was. Completely the opposite of those who are asking him the question. For you and I, living now, living in a world long since fallen into sin, living in a world where the new towers of Babel continue to sprout up everywhere, these things that tempt us to make ourselves God and therefore obscure the view of God from where we stand, to make God my God in this radical individualistic way that says whatever I feel is right and decide is right for me must be something that God put in me. I'm this way because God made me this way. I was born this way, though I needed 15,000 prescriptions and 24 surgeries to do it. This is my true self, and it is not our true self. It's not our true self down any of those roads or avenues we take, whether it's gluttony, whether it's lust for riches or wealth, whether it's fame, whether it's sex, whether it's good old-fashioned booze or drugs, or the new thing trending now, whatever people's profile pictures are covered with on Facebook. Infinite number of roads that tempt us to be what we decide that we want to be and therefore twist the view of God from where we are, that we don't know what the Israelites knew. There's no standing in the presence of God without a mediator. And this, this is the God, the God who becomes man, the God who comes as an innocent baby, delivered into the world to deliver us from ourselves, our sinfulness, and our weakness. In this moment when all things are being prepared to be made right, that God the Savior has entered the world, that he will live in our place and die in our place and rise again victorious and return again in glory. This is the God who stands between us and our own condemnation, the God whose face we are able to see and who is able to look upon us through the mediation of his own blood on the cross the God who was able to deliver us from that bondage in Egypt, from, those golden, from the golden calf and the idolatry at the mountain, to deliver us from this present darkness, the God who can sift all of the stuff out of us, our fake accoutrements, our surgical attachments, our modifications, the drugs floating around in our bloodstream, our lusts and our desires that fill us in our darkest moments, for whatever it is the world has to offer, Jesus Christ, the child of Bethlehem, can tear all of that out of us in this process of perfecting and enlightening and illuminating and making us new at the resurrection. This is the joy of Christmas, not just that he is born as a child in the manger, but we are reborn as children, made new, made innocent, made pure and freed from our sin. That is who we are, sinners in need of a savior. This is what we are, the nativity, those who believe in God who has come into the flesh to save us sinners and be that savior in Jesus' name. Amen.